Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to be putting all of you to sleep and boring you with research methods. Just kidding, just kidding. Although this is the point in the class where you tend to lose everybody because you're like, research methods, oh man. But it turns out this is incredibly important and the farther you go along in school, the more mastery you have of research methods, the easier it is, especially once you get to graduate school. Um, and even to finish out your bachelor's degree, uh, you tend to have to do a large study or something at the end, you know, just like a final project, and you generally will involve some research methods. Um, so it's really good knowledge to have. You'll use it all the way through school. So even if, you know, it bores you for one week, uh, it turns out it's just ridiculously important. You know, I remember teaching back in the day, I always wanted to skip this subject until I realized how important it truly was. And then I was like, we can never skip this subject. It's too important. All right, so let's delve in. So again, I always play the game with my class. What class are we in? Sociology. What are we studying? Society. What is society defined as? Groups of people with something in common along with institutions and social behaviors. But again, how do we study society? How do we study groups of people? And in sociology, of course, where our main focus is on big groups of people, the macro sociology. But again, we are also interested in the small groups and individuals with micro sociology. And all of these research methods enable us to study people in general. Um, you, these are the same research methods you use in psychology, sociology, uh, just a general study of social sciences. We're going to be looking at quantitative and qualitative research methods. Um, in sociology, we're going to focus on both, it turns out. Um, you do a lot of statistics, a lot of correlations. Whenever you hear numbers like 40% of people get a uh, bachelor's degree in the United States, that's quantitative data. But that data doesn't always tell us why. Sometimes we need other methods to go out and understand, well, why did some people succeed? Why did some people decide not to go to college? And really delve into the research to understand people's motivations, their experiences, things along those lines. So in sociology, we will use both quantitative and qualitative. In a lot of these methods, we can introduce things that are mixed methods, a blending of quantitative and qualitative. For example, we can build a survey that has quantitative questions, questions that we can turn into numbers, such as what is your attitude toward abortion? And then we can create a Likert scale from agree to disagree, and then agree we can label number one, and disagree label number five, and in the middle you have neutral three. And again, we can use these words and then apply numbers to them and then do statistical analysis to you know, figure out where people's attitudes are towards abortion, for example. We can also do qualitative research. We can go out and ask open-ended questions. And, you know, how do you feel about abortion? Why do you feel that way? What's your political stance, etc.? And then we can blend these, though. We can do, you know, surveys that have both the statistical Likert scale type of quantitative research, and then we can also have open-ended questions that let people fill in the blanks. And then we can code their responses for common themes, clusters of meanings to make sense of their understanding and experience of abortion. So basically the two types of research methods that we're going to use, and again some studies use exclusively one, and again some studies will do mixed methods, are going to be quantitative and qualitative. So to study groups of people, we can gather numerical data, statistics, we can look at fertility rates, we can look at death rates, all of your crime statistics, we can look at college statistics, we can look at income, we can look at percentage of people that agree, like identify with a specific religion, or we can look at diversity factors and apply numbers to them. There is so much you can do with quantitative data. Um, so again, when you say quantitative, you're talking about numerical data, numbers. Qualitative data, non-numerical data. Okay, we're going out and doing ethnography to look for, you know, theory generation of why people act the way they do, phenomenology to understand their experiences, naturalistic observation to look at the people's cultures and observe their common way of life. We can go out and ask people questions and do in-depth interviews. We can do open-ended surveys. There's tons of ways to do qualitative research. Again, this is just a quick introduction to the two types of research methods, one using numbers, quantitative data, one using non-numerical data, qualitative data. I did put in here this idea of facts versus associations and correlations. 
And again, in sociology, we're a little critical of the word fact because again, one, it's really hard to prove causation in the social world, but we're also philosophers and we like the idea of prove you exist, prove you don't exist. Hence the idea that all life is subjective and objectivity is truly just a myth because nobody can even get outside of their head. So yes, we have evidence that, you know, red shift, you know, means that universes are going away from us. But again, prove that, you know, you're not just in some giant's mind or some silliness like that. But again, the prove it, disprove it theory. So in sociology, yes, there's the concept of social facts, these very strong patterns. But again, what we're really looking at are associations between variables, any relationship, and then correlations, linear relationships amongst variables. So we can ask, is there an association between educational attainment and income? And we can't say for sure that income is your cause of whether or not you end up getting a bachelor's degree. But we can say there's an association between those in poverty getting less college degrees than those that are not in poverty. Okay, and there's a correlation. As income increases, educational attainment increases, which then kind of sheds the light on those that are growing up in higher socioeconomic status families tend to get more college degrees than those that are not. And that's, again, the sad truth about society. It's that it's not fair that those in poverty don't have as much access and opportunities as those not in poverty, for example. But when we do the studies, this is what we find. Hence, poverty is hugely important on overall outcomes when it comes to groups of people. The quick methodology for the scientific method, the steps, and again, this is, you know, you can mix this up, but generally we go out and we define the problem, okay? We try to figure out what is it we're trying to study. Then we look into the literature to figure out what is known and what is not known. Then in quantitative research, you always have a hypothesis. You expect this to happen, you know, if this does this. But in qualitative research, you don't always need a hypothesis, and sometimes it's frowned upon with a lot of research like phenomenology, because, you know, the idea is to, to not go in with any ideas, any bias walking in, to go in and let the research speak for itself and then interpret the findings. So, of course, you don't want to go in with any expectations, hence the no hypotheses. We then select a research design. And then we do the research, and then we interpret the results, and then we report our findings in our scholarly journals or any other media that you can get it out there. And for this lecture, to make it easy for you, I just had this chart that I had, you know, had to do. Again, when you get into grad school, you delve deep into research methods. Um, so here's just some examples of research methods. Again, we have experiments. These are when you can have complete control, okay? So this is what you imagine in science when you have the lab setting. And okay, and this is very hard to do in sociology experiments. So you're not going to see this very much. You're going to see some more qualitative research more often. But again, to do an experiment, you need three types of controls. You need randomization, manipulation, and a comparison or control group. And it's very hard to have these in sociology. Uh, but some examples of experiments, we have single case experimental designs. That's when we're looking at the behavior of a single participant. Um, and then they are randomly selected. We manipulate the variables and we have a comparison and control group there and are their own control group in that case. We can have a reversal or an ABA design. Again, we observe a participant, then we give them the treatment, then we observe them after treatment. You can have multiple baselines. We administer treatment over a period of time to many different people. We look for different behaviors in different settings, and then we try to observe the effect of the treatment. Um, you have ABBB designs. Um, when you change the treatment after a res person responds to it, you have between subjects designs where we're um, comparing people within a group, we have within subject is the, um, between groups, within subjects, experimental designs, controlling within a group, factorial experimental designs, researcher has two or more independent variables, and again, it goes on forever. And then we have quasi-experiment designs, one group post-test, so basically you just give them a test, interpret the results. You have the pre-test, post-test, you give them a pre-test, 
then you give them a treatment, then you give them a post-test. Um, Non-equivalent control group post-test only when a control group is required, but no pre-test available. And again, there's just so many different types of designs. I'm not going to bore you with all of these. There's time series designs where we give uh, someone a treatment and then we wait for a certain amount of time, measure, treatment, wait. Interrupted time series where we vary the times. We have longitudinal designs. This is when we study people across a lifespan or across several years or months or whatever it might be. We have cross-sectional designs where we take different groups. We, get, we then in, look at it just one time instead of across a lifespan. Um, you have non-experimental correlational designs like naturalistic observation where you go into their environment and observe. Surveys using scale items that can use Likert type scales, whatever it might be. So we have quantitative data and correlational designs to look at the associations between two variables. When it comes to qualitative research, these are the ones we're going to focus on more in sociology um, when it comes to things that we can't use numbers for. So again, naturalistic observation, going out and making observant, uh, observations and coding the themes. Um, we have phenomenology, which is looking at the subjective experiences. Um, we have ethnography, going out and studying people's experiences, groups, cultures, but then trying to create a theory to make sense of what their experiences were. We have the case study where we go out and do in-depth interviews with individuals, existing data research, such as going out and looking at archives. Um, and so there are so many different types of research methods, but really what you need to take out of all of this is the idea of quantitative versus quanti qualitative, quantitative being numerical designs, qualitative designs being non-numerical studies, and there are tons of different types of designs um, and again, you guys will go way deeper in this when you get to your junior and senior year and have to take research methods. Again, it's just a quick introduction, not to bore you completely. Uh, but again, for our quantitative research, we have the main ones. We're using experiments, quasi-experiments, and non-experimental designs that do give us numbers. And then for our qualitative research methods, again, naturalistic observations, doing field studies, phenomenology, studying the subjective experiences of participants and trying to code those themes. Um, ethnography, going out and studying groups and trying to come up with theories to explain behavior. Case study, looking at individuals and studying them through interviews. Or existing data, looking at archives, um, newspapers, any form of media you can find. Studies, past studies, doing meta-analysis of past studies to see what they found. The list is extremely extensive. Some major terms we should pull out of this chapter, we're looking at population. When we're talking about population, we're looking at the whole group that we're trying to study. So for example, if we were trying to figure out how many college students graduate uh, with a bachelor's in the United States, that's the whole population is all students in the United States. But if we just wanted to take a part or a section of that, because it's hard to study all people, we then get a sample. So a sample is a part of the population. We try to get representative samples. So again, if we're looking at all people in the United States, we need to have a diverse sample of different sexes, genders, races, different regions so that it's representative of all people in the United States, different ages. We do try to do random sampling so um, we can build in some validity to our research and so and make it more generalizable so we don't just go out and select you know the first person we see if we're doing random sampling um, there's a bunch of different ways to do this you can do stratified random sampling like go through the phone book and every 10th person becomes a possible participant your book doesn't go too deep into all of this but you don't have to do random sampling though because not all studies can you just randomly select people for your study. So we also have purposive uh, sampling where we go out and look and just choose a specific person that we know meets the criteria. Snowball sampling, you meet somebody and then they suggest somebody else. And again, the sampling methods go on extensively. We'll get you some more of that later on in college, but just to introduce you to it. Uh, we also have the correlation studies, such as measures of central tendency, the mean, the average, uh, the median, the mode, standard deviation, how far different segments of the group are from the mean. We have correlation coefficients, the statistical associations between variables. 
And then again, whenever possible, especially with quantitative research, we seek for reliability, consistency in our studies, and then also validity, accuracy of our results are very important terms. So again, it's just a quick introduction. I really just want you to pull out quantitative and qualitative from here, okay? Numerical studies versus non-numerical studies. Recognize that we can do a lot with statistics. We can go out and ask, you know, how many college students graduate? 40%. But why is it that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics, 40% of whites, and 67% of Asians get college degrees? And so you're seeing there's an association between race and educational attainment. But it doesn't really tell us why. Why do Asians get so many more college degrees than whites and blacks and Hispanics? Why do blacks and Hispanics get less degrees than whites and, and Asians? And how much of that has to do with things like racism, oppression, privilege, and power? And then for Asians, how much of their success is things like culture, common ways of life? And so we need both research methods to go out and basically understand as much as we can about the social world. Uh, but again, anytime you hear us talking about numerical data in this class, we're looking at, that's just quantitative research. People went out and pulled statistics. And we're looking at people's experiences, for example, qualitative data. What is the experience of being black while watering your lawn, for example, when the white neighbor calls the police and then you get arrested just for helping out your neighbor who asked you to water their flowers while you were, while they were out of town? You know, and so... The numbers don't tell us. They do tell us that these experiences of discrimination exist, but it doesn't always tell us why. Hence the need for both methods. Okay, thank you so much. I wish you the best.